Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the Rubenstein Uniqueness Proof. I cover Rubenstein bargaining in Chapter 10 of Game Theory 101 Bargaining. Check the video description for more information on that. Though I don't actually cover what we're going to be talking about here today in the book, and the reason is that the Rubenstein Uniqueness Proof is highly technical, and it's the kind of thing that someone would only really need to know if they were having to solve these sorts of bargaining games on their own. Maybe they were in a class and had a problem set with various different types of infinite horizon bargaining, and so they needed to figure out the way to go ahead and show that certain strategies are in fact the only strategies that work. So again, this lecture is going to be pretty technical, and it's understandable if you want to skip it for that reason. Nevertheless, what's our goal here? Well, previously we assumed that the players were going to play stationary strategies. That was that they were going to play the exact same thing in every odd period, and then in every even period they're also going to play something that's going to be identical in each of those even periods. We assumed this because it was easy to solve for the game if we made that assumption, but it still left open this question whether that there, whether there are any other solutions to the game that don't involve these stationary strategies. So to be a little bit more precise there, what we want to know is if there are any other sub-game perfect equilibria to Rubenstein bargaining that don't involve the stationary strategies that we've discussed previously. So that's what we're going to be looking at here today, and the answer is that there aren't any other subgame perfect equilibria. We assumed stationary strategies, but in fact the stationary strategies are the only solution to the game. Now, as I go about proving that this is the case, a bit of a warning, a bit of a heads up here, what I'm going to be doing is going to look like black magic. I am going to be doing slides and slides of algebra, and the algebra I'm going to be doing doesn't appear to have any rhyme or reason behind it. I'm just going to be taking these numbers and manipulating them, and it's not going to be exactly clear why I'm doing that. And yet, ultimately, by the end of this, I will give you a full proof using all of that algebra to show you that the stationary strategies are, in fact, the unique solution to the game. And it's important to learn this process, this algorithm that I'm essentially going to be giving you, because it works in a ton of these Infinite Horizon bargaining games. And usually if you want to figure out what the all the solutions are to an Infinite Horizon bargaining game, then you go about it by taking stationary strategies, solving for the equilibria that involve stationary strategies, and then using this algorithm to show that those stationary strategies are in fact the unique equilibrium. So this is something that's common in a lot of bargaining games, which is why it's really useful to know. The trick that we're going to use is figuring out when the, what the minimum and maximum continuation values are for each player. So we're going to let HA be Albert's largest possible continuation value in any subgame perfect equilibrium, and LA be his lowest. So HA is just saying in the most ideal circumstances when we're playing equilibrium strategies, in any equilibrium, what is the best possible payoff for me? So we're taking the equilibrium that's the best possible equilibrium for Albert and asking Albert, what does Albert get in that equilibrium? That's his highest value, and the lowest value is analogous. That's in the worst possible conditions for him in equilibrium. What's the smallest amount that he can get? And of course, we have the same sort of continuation values for player two for Barbara. So HB is going to be Barbara's best possible continuation value in any subgame perfect equilibrium. And LB is going to be her lowest possible continuation value. All right, we can start defining what these continuation values have to look like. So let's think about Albert's continuation values. First thing to note, top bullet point there, is that his highest continuation value has a top uh, part. It has a ceiling. You can't go past a certain amount, which is one minus Barbara's lowest possible continuation value times her discount factor. Why is that the case? Well, in one of these odd periods where Albert is making an offer to Barbara, to get Barbara to accept in the best possible circumstances, Albert is going to have to give her the smallest amount she could possibly hope for in an equilibrium times her discount factor. That would be the very minimum amount that Barbara would need to receive in order to be willing to accept an offer. And so delta B LB is that amount. And so Albert's best possible continuation value has to be one minus that amount. So the ceiling on Albert's highest possible continuation value is one minus delta B LB. 
Now, similarly, we can put a floor on Albert's lowest possible continuation value. So there are some set of strategies in an equilibrium where Barbara receives the highest possible amount, HB. That's her highest continuation value. And if we're in that sort of situation, the way Albert is going to have to go about it to get Barbara to accept is to offer Barbara her highest continuation value multiplied by her discount factor once again. So that means that in the circumstance where Barbara is going to receive her highest possible amount in uh, her highest possible continuation value in a subgame perfect equilibrium, then Albert's lowest possible amount he receives still has to be at least as big as the remainder of that offer size, or 1 minus delta B HB. Now, I can multiply the second bullet point by negative 1, and when I do it, it looks like that. And now I can take these two inequalities and add them together. So I'm going to add the left side to the left side and the right side to the right side. Just to be clear, this is holding up mathematical principles. I can actually do this. This is legitimate. And the reason is that if you take two greater values and add them together, that's going to be greater than two lower values when you add them together. So I can do this following step legitimately. I can take line one and add it to line two, and that gives me line three. So I get the highest possible continuation value for Albert minus the lowest possible continuation value has to be less than or equal to the two right sides of the inequalities in lines one and two added together. I can simplify that a little bit more on the right-hand side. So the right-hand side is going to be the discount factor for Barbara times her highest continuation value possible minus her lowest continuation value possible. So again, we've done a lot of algebra and it's not exactly clear what this has helped us with, but again, bear with me for a few more slides of algebra and you'll see why this is going to work out very nicely. Now the next thing to notice is that what I just did previously in all of those slides was not without loss of generality. So uh, essentially what I can do here is look at the same sort of situation and flip everything around. So rather than having us figuring out what Albert's highest possible continuation value is and putting a ceiling on it, and then finding out what his lowest possible continuation value is and putting a floor on it, I can do the exact same thing for Barbara. So if I flip between these two slides really quickly, all I've done is switch all of the subscripts from one player to the other player. And so by virtue of the fact that this game is symmetrical, the odd periods are identical from from the even periods from the player's uh, reversed standpoints, then I can get this last bullet point here, this fourth bullet point, without actually having to do any extra work other than just flipping the subscripts. So we also know, by virtue of what we've done previously, that the highest continuation value for Barbara minus the lowest continuation value for her is less than or equal to Albert's discount factor times his highest continuation value minus his lowest continuation value. So if I take the last two lines of the previous two slides, I'm left with this. Again, doesn't seem too helpful yet, but with just a little bit more work, we will get to the completed proof here. I can take that second line and divide by discount factor for Albert, right? The discount factor is an amount that's above zero, so I can divide by it. And when I do that, I get the second line there. Notice now that I have the highest continuation value for Albert minus the lowest continuation value for Albert in two different places here, so I can string these inequalities together. And when I do that, I get this third line. So all I've done now is string the two inequalities together to produce the third line. And by virtue of the fact that this third line is true, I can cut out this middleman and just focus on the end, uh, end value. So if I remove the highest value for continuation, highest continuation value for Albert minus lowest value continuation value for Albert, what I get is the highest continuation value for Barbara minus the lowest for Barbara divided by Albert's discount factor has to be less than or equal to Barbara's discount factor times her highest minus her lowest continuation value. Again, lots of algebra, not really clear why I'm doing this, but wait just one step further. We have an uh, inequality that looks pretty simple, and we can make it even simpler by multiplying the discount factor for Albert to both sides, and we're left with that last inequality there. And believe it or not, this is the last line of the proof. So why is this the last line of the proof? Well, let me interpret it for you. What this is saying is that the difference in continuation values for Barbara must be less than those same difference, or that same difference in continuation values for Barbara, times the discount factors for both of the players. 
All right, well, when can this inequality be true? Notice that on the right side of the inequality, the right side has to be greater than the left side. Yet we're still having the same exact values on both sides. The difference is that on the right side, we're taking that value and we're multiplying it by two numbers that are less than one. Those discount factors are between zero and one. So they're having this effect of shrinking the value HB minus LB. But HB minus LB appears on both sides. So the only way that this inequality can hold is if HB minus LB is equal to zero. If those values are anything other than zero here, then it's not going to be possible to fulfill this inequality. So the punchline is that the highest possible continuation value is equal to the lowest possible continuation value for both players. That's because the highest possible continuation value minus the lowest possible continuation value has to be equal to zero. All right, well, that also works not only in this slide where we did it for Barbara, but it also works for Albert, which is why we can say it about both players. So the continuation value in the best possible circumstance for both players has to be equal to the respective player's worst possible continuation value in a subgame perfect equilibrium. So these values need to be the same, and in fact we know how to reach this sort of strategy, how to reach this sort of outcome. The only way for this to occur is for the players to use the stationary strategies that we solved for before. Those stationary strategies produce the same continuation value, and those continuation values, because they're just a single value, they're the same value in every single period, we know that the highest possible and the lowest po possible is equal to the exact, exact same thing, and it's that value right there. So again, what have we done here to re recap? We've done a whole bunch of algebra, and the algebra ultimately showed us that the highest possible continuation value for any given player is equal to his or her lowest possible continuation value, and that's true for all players. And the only way for the highest possible continuation value to be equal to the lowest possible continuation value is if in every single stage, in every single period, they're receiving the exact same continuation value as they would in another period. And the way you do that is by having stationary strategies, and specifically the stationary strategies that we looked at previously. So that was a lot of algebra. I am now going to take a big deep breath and say, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time when we will start talking about uh, more sources of bargaining power and focus less on these Rubenstein sort of games. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.